Lord, I shall give these laws unto thy people. Hear me. Oh, hear me. All pay heed. The Lord, the Lord Jehovah, has given unto you these 15. Oi. Ten. Ten commandments. God has set before you this day his laws of life. I'm going to miss that video. <laughs> when I moved to Dallas, I heard a rumor that I hope is fact, that Dallas has more restaurants per capita than New York. It certainly seems true. But despite the number of restaurants that we have, we still have one restaurant that it seems like every corner of the globe has, Chili's. And if you've ever been to Chili's, you've probably had this happen, where you walk in and you have this grandiose ambition to eat something that you haven't gotten there before. So you go and you sit down and you open up the menu and instantly you are overwhelmed by choice. Chili's can offer you like nine different kinds of hamburgers, a bunch of different kinds of appetizers, uh, salad, newsflash, their salad's not that healthy, and then they have like a guilt-free menu that's like under 600 calories, so if you want to go that route, you can. They also have Tex-Mex, because I guess because it's called Chili's. They have so many different options for you. And what happens to me when I go into Chili's is I think to myself, I'm going to get something different. But every time I sit down and look at the menu, I always wind up with the same thing. It's either going to be one of those big burgers, or it's going to be their like, three different kinds of chicken crispers that they have, the chicken tenders, right? And so I'm sitting there, and I'm wanting to get something different, and I can't because there's so much choice. There's actually a name for this. Sociologists call it analysis paralysis, which I really love the rhyming. It's called analysis paralysis, and it's when you're faced with so many different options that it creates a sense of anxiety and a sense of stress in you that you default to whatever is natural, whatever is instinctual, or whatever you've done before. So even if you don't want the chicken crispers, you're still going to get the chicken crispers because you can't help yourself. And so in our world, we live in a world that is infinitely customizable. You are daily faced with a veritable Chili's menu of options. Different ways to go to work, different cars to drive to get you to work. You don't even have to drive a car. You can ride a motorcycle, or you can take the bus, or the train, or Uber. You've got tons of different options there. You've got different options on where you can live, different places to work. You have so much choice that it shouldn't be a big surprise that in our world, one of the Number one mental illnesses that people struggle with is anxiety. I believe some people have said it's even uh, outstripped depression as the number one mental illness that people struggle with. And it might not be that you feel anxious. You might be like, this is fine. And the reason why you feel like it's fine is because you're always anxious. You're like the Hulk, right? That's your secret. You're always, he's always angry. You're just always anxious. And your spouse is like, yeah, he is, he is. We are constantly worried and in a state of anxiety, and I believe that one of the reasons why this is is because we see so many things that we could have, but we don't have. Things that we could have, different routes that we could go, but we don't have the resources or the means to choose everything. And we're dissatisfied at the end of the meal with our chicken crispers. So what I want us to talk about today is we're going to finish the Ten Commandments, hopefully. We're going to finish the Ten Commandments today. And we're going to talk about coveting. And I want you to remember, the Ten Commandments are given to us, given to Israel by a God that loves them and loves us and is giving us commandments for our protection and our provision because he's created us and he knows how we're supposed to function. He knows the way we're supposed to work. And so what I'm hoping we're going to see today is that we can leave behind a life of anxiety and a life of worry induced by covetous, by our desires run rampant. And we can actually have peace. We can have rest. We can have joy. We can have life. So we're in Exodus chapter 20. But like most of these commandments, we'll, we'll hang out there for a little bit, and then we're going to jump to some other passages. So follow along if you can. But we're going to look at desire, we're going to look at anxiety, and then we're going to look at peace. So the first thing I want you to see is that desire leads to coveting. Desire leads 
to coveting. Look at chapter 20, verse 17 of Exodus. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. The Tenth Commandment makes the Ten Commandments something more than just a legal code. In fact, you can make a good argument that the Tenth Commandment is the most unique commandment in all of the Ten Commandments. Because there is no other ancient Near East society that we know of that had a law against doing something that nobody can see. Remember we talked about last week, uh, this culture, if you're trying somebody, if you're legislating against them, you have to have witnesses. Well, unless you act on your desire, nobody knows that you feel that way except for you and the Lord. And so here you have a law against feeling a certain way, wanting something, even if you don't express it, which means that the Ten Commandments are more than just a legal code. There's something more than that. They're a gift that's been given to Israel and given to us to show the way, show the fact that God wants certain things out of a relationship with us. And one of the chief things that he wants, one of the chief things that the Ten Commandments shows us is that he wants more than just outward obedience. He wants more than just good looks. He wants your heart, too. He wants what's inside. He wants what's inside. So what is coveting? T. Desmond Alexander, which is an awesome name, says it's the inappropriate craving to have someone or something that belongs to a neighbor's household. Now, don't get hung up on the someone and the, the ownership, the possession piece. That is simply a way of referring to somebody else has committed to somebody else, like a spouse has made a commitment, and desiring that person is inappropriate and sinful. So coveting is a somewhat consuming desire to have something that is owned by or belonged to uh, another person. Now this can be an actual item that they possess. So you see somebody else's spouse and you say, I want that spouse, or I want that house, or I want those clothes, I want that specific item, or... It can be a like item, something that's like that. So you see somebody with a new iPhone and you think, I want a phone like that. Or I want a social life like theirs. Or I want a marriage that's as exciting and vibrant as theirs. Like theirs. I don't want theirs, but I want one like it. When God gives the second iteration of the commands in Deuteronomy, he repeats this commandment. And he says, you shall not covet. And the first word is the same Hebrew word that's used in Exodus 20. But the second time that he says it, he says the word covet, it changes. And that word is, is sort of an implication that what you want runs counter to what God wants for your life. And what you want might even drive you to leave behind the laws of God and pursue it regardless of what God thinks. Coveting, desire unchecked, will lead you into rebellion. Coveting, essentially, is comparison. It's me looking at what God has blessed you and then looking back at my stuff and saying, why did I get the short end of the stick, God? Why does he or she have more than me and my family? It's not fair. It's telling God that the good gifts you've given me aren't quite good enough when I look at what other people have. It's comparison. And essentially, it's our desires that lead us into coveting. Desires aren't bad. It's okay to want things. But unchecked, it leads us into coveting. Turn with me to James, James chapter 4. We're going to be done in Exodus uh, 20. But James chapter 4. So we've traversed thousands of years. We've left Mount Sinai. We're in the church age now. The Holy Spirit has descended, and yet still, people are struggling with wanting things that belong to other people. And what's happening is this is leading to fighting and quarreling in the church that James is writing to. Look at verse 1 of chapter 4. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? How is it that our desires, that aren't necessarily bad, lead us to do all sorts of things that might hurt other people, like taking their spouse, taking their stuff, and possibly even taking their life? What is it about desire, and how does it become coveting? Well, one thing you need to understand about coveting, it's not just me wanting your stuff. I don't just want your stuff. That's inane. That's innocuous. That's, that's not deep enough. I don't want your stuff. I want your lifestyle. So when I look at your clothes, and I think, man, I wish I had that. 
I don't want your clothes to look on me the way they look on me. I want your clothes to look the way on you, that the, the way on me that they would look on you. I want to look as good or better in your stuff as you do. So when I look at your spouse, I don't just want your spouse. I want her because she's going to make me feel better about me because I'm going to be better than you. I want your lifestyle. I don't just want your income. I want the power and the prestige that comes with it. I want the social life. I want your lifestyle. That's what coveting is. It's not just wanting another person's stuff. It's looking again at your own life and recognizing that your life doesn't quite measure up to the life of another person. Coveting is way deeper than just stuff. I want you to watch this commercial, and I want you to see if you can identify where desire becomes coveting. Okay? All right, so where is it? First, he starts by saying, how do you want to live your life? And then he starts introducing what are universal moral standards, always showing up, which means being reliable, being faithful. Do you want to be a good father, a good son, a good husband, which are universal moral standards. And if you're a Christian, good is doing what God wants you to do, good and God, that's, that they go together, right? But the, regardless, good is seen as a universal moral standard. And then there's a change. Is that it? Do you just want to live up to universal moral standards, or do you want to be better than everybody else? Employee of the year, comparative statement. Husband, father of the year, comparative statement. Like a rebel, comparative statement. Better than everybody else. The linchpin. The linchpin. Basically, do you want to be God? And if you do, buy this truck. And at the end, he says, we couldn't agree with you more. You didn't say anything. You didn't bring anything to light. You didn't offer anything to the conversation. You have literally been told what to think, what lifestyle you should desire, and that coveting's fine. And you know what? Couldn't agree with you more. I can't, be, I can't imagine that what Satan said to Eve in the Garden of Eden, looking at that fruit, looking at that apple, was any different. It does look good, doesn't it? I couldn't agree with you more. And she didn't say a word, and neither did Adam. Coveting is looking at somebody else's stuff and realizing yours isn't good enough and wanting it for your own. And this, if I can say, this craving that takes place constantly going on leads us into problems, not just with other people, but with ourselves. Coveting leads us to anxiety. Coveting leads us to anxiety. Look back at verse 1 of chapter 4. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this? that your passions are at war within you. Notice where James lands the fight. Your, your issue is with you, that your desires are at war within you. He's not talking about desires are at war in the church, like one faction, another faction. He's talking about within the heart of the person. Your desires are internally causing issues. There's a battle going on inside of you, and it's rooted in the fact that we're consumed with getting things. Let me paint you a picture. Some of you are going to be home uh, tonight, maybe sometime this week, and it's going to be late at night, and you're going to be on your phone. You're not ready to go to bed yet, so you're looking at things, or you're on your computer, and you're on Amazon, or you're on Pinterest, or you're on a blog, and you're seeing things that you want. Now, you're not going to buy them yet, but you're going to put them in this wonderful little thing called a wish list. It's going to go over there in the wish list. And you're going to stay up, and, and Amazon's super helpful. They're like, man, you want some other stuff like that? We got some other stuff like that. <laughs> Here you go. Put that in your wish list, too. And you think to yourself, man, I better put it in there because Christmas is coming and Mama's going to ask what I want. Or Santa's going to ask what I want. And I got it right there. Boom. Bam. Ready to go. It's 
ready to go in my wish list. Or it's on a Pinterest blog or a little board that you got, and the board's like, if I had a million dollars, this is what I'd buy, right? And we lose sleep over it. We stay up way too late wanting things, coveting things, desiring things. We watch TV well into the night, inundated with commercials like this, telling us, we couldn't agree with you more. You absolutely want this truck. Come on, come buy it. Come buy it. Or we're just bored. And we're scrolling through social media. Maybe it's a Friday night. Young adults, youth, middle school. You guys are at home on a Friday night. And you're fine with being home on a Friday night until you get on social media. And you see posts on Instagram that your friends have put up and they're out doing things. They're at a party that maybe you weren't invited to or they're at a social event that you originally maybe were invited to. And you're like, nah, I'm going to stay home. But all of a sudden you look at the fun they're having and you're thinking to yourself, what am I missing out on? Look at my Friday night here at home and look at their Friday night out having fun and you covet, you desire, you want their life, you want what they're doing. Or we lie awake at night and try and figure out how to keep the stuff that we've already got. Do you know that the average, well, not the average American, Americans as a whole spend $20.4 billion on home security every year? $20.4 billion. So what we do is it, we want to go to work or we want to go to school and not worry that somebody's going to break in and take our stuff, right? Which is great, which is fine. But if you don't believe that coveting is a thing, if you own a home security system, then you have agreed with me that coveting exists because you believe that somewhere, somehow, somebody is laying awake at night trying to figure out how to get your stuff. And you're like, I'm going to have a home security system to protect myself. Coveting desires that produces all this anxiety because we're not only concerned with getting the things that we want, we're also really consumed with making sure we don't lose any of the things that we already got. Possession more. And it creates quite a bit of anxiety. And you might think to yourself, Travis, if I want to get stuff and I want to keep stuff, what business is it of yours? It is a victimless crime. Leave me alone and let me have my wish list. Let me do what I want. But I'd say you're wrong. It's not a victimless crime. It's not a victimless crime. One, you're a victim. Some of you might be able to just turn over one page, but turn over to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, because Peter does us a favor. He's going to say essentially the same thing James does, but Peter is about as blunt as a sledgehammer, and he doesn't mince words. So chapter 2, verse 11, he tells us this. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Against your soul. You can go back to James. He says they wage war against your soul. What if the things that you want, what if the very things that you desire are actually making you less human? What if your desires run rampant and run unchecked are creating in you something that you were never meant to be. That when God knitted you together in the womb of your mother and was rejoicing over the prospect of what might be, you are now unrecognizable to that original intent because we are so consumed with desire for things. What if we're just a people possessed by consumption? If you want to know if that's you, what do you think about? What do you run to when you have a bad day? Is the answer to that question, I've got to go buy something to make myself feel better? You're a consumer. For me, what my life looks like is I break my day up into three incredibly edible segments, breakfast, lunch, <laughs> dinner. And there's probably an ice cream sandwich at the end of that day too. Love ice cream sandwiches. The cheaper, the better. It's just, it's a fact. I don't know why that is. We're consumers. We want to consume. What if you can't view yourself as a beloved image of God, beloved bearer of the image of God, because you're too busy looking at everybody else's stuff and thinking, I'm inadequate. I don't have what they have. I'm not doing what they're doing. And if I don't have the things that I want, then that makes me unhappy with my life. And if I'm unhappy with my life, I can't imagine that God's very happy with it either. And our self-worth and our, our perception of how God views us is infinitely distorted by our desires. And again, desires aren't bad, but when we let desires run unchecked, it becomes coveting. 
George Carlin, the comedian, who's an atheist, actually, uh, said this, trying to be happy by accumulating possessions is like trying to satisfy hunger by taping sandwiches all over your body. He's pretty funny. Even he recognizes the disconnect between acquisition and happiness. A soul is a core part of who you are as a person. You're more than a soul. You're also a body. But it's a core part of who you are. And you are never going to be you as long as you're trying to be them. You're never going to be you as long as you're trying to be everybody else. Because we don't just pick one person to be like. We want this person's job. We want a spouse like this person's. We want a life like this person's. We want to live where that person is. And you cobble together this person that's essentially Frankenstein. Unrecognizable and grotesque. You are never going to be you, the person that God intended you to be, if you're spending all of your time trying to be everybody else. It doesn't work. But you're not the only victim. Other people are the victims as well. Look back at chapter 4 of James, verse 2. You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel, and you do not have because you do not ask. Greek literature is often laying at the feet of covetousness, of envy, of jealousy, all manners of evil in the world. And James is really not doing anything different. If you go read the Iliad, what starts the Trojan War? Paris of Troy desires Helen, who is the wife of another man, and they take her away to Troy, and it starts one of the greatest wars in history. All because one man wanted another man's wife. And Greek literature does this over and over and over again, and so does James. James is doing the same thing. James is saying this is leading to violence, and malevolence in the church. I don't think it's outright murder. Some people do. Some people think it's actually murdering each other in the church because they're jealous. And you know what it is that they want? Some scholars think that they actually want because of the language of the rest of the book of James talks a lot about seeking and desiring wisdom. They think that the people in the congregation are actually looking at people in leadership positions who are displaying wisdom and they're going to God and they're jealous and they're envious because they want the wisdom that God has given them for themselves so that they can have power and prestige that comes with it. They want something good, and they're willing to hurt other people to get it. If that makes any sense. Envy does the same thing for us. Now, we might not be physically violent when we want somebody else's stuff. We've evolved. Society has moved past that. But you don't have to go far in history to find, out, find wars that never fired a shot. Most of the second half of the 20th century was occupied by a war that never fired a shot, and it was called the... Cold War. Good job. In our news today, you hear a lot of language about a, what kind of war? Trade war. Not supposed to fire a shot. We've mastered the art of non-physical violence. So you might do something like an embargo. You might embargo people that you're jealous of, that you're envious of. You want what they have so you don't give them any love, any affection. You aren't generous with them. You try and choke them out so that they would lose their place and you could uh, take it from them. We embargo people. We fight by proxy. So we don't actually fight the person that we're angry with. We fight people around them. So I am jealous of you, so I'm going to take it out on your kids or your spouse. Or maybe you're angry with your spouse. You're struggling at home, and so you take it out on your kids. Or maybe there's a guy at work, and a gal at work maybe that you were equal with, and they just got a promotion even though they didn't deserve it. So now you can't do anything as retribution against them, so what do you do instead? You take it out on everybody in their department. You try and undermine everything that they're doing so that they slip and fall, and you can then take that spot. That is covetous, and that's fighting a war by proxy. Lastly, we have covert warfare, covert ops, right? This is how we work. Passive-aggressive, talk behind people's back, undermine, slander, and then you watch the empire fall. And we go and we pick up the pieces. Scavenging. Other people are the victims or our covetous, covetous desires. Lastly, God's glory is a victim. God's glory is a victim. Look at verse 3. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend on your passions. I think it's very good that we take our desires to God. Regardless of why we want them, we should take those desires to God. But we should also take our motivations to God as well recognizing that they might not be the purest of motives. Like I said, it's okay to want things. 
And it's okay to go to God and say, Lord, I want this. Is this a valid desire or not? But the people that James was writing to, they were asking for things wrongly. And so let me ask you, what do you want and why do you want it? Do you want a wife? Because you want to be like everybody else and you look at your life and you think everybody else is getting married and it's one great cosmic uh, musical chairs and I'm afraid I'm going to be left without a seat. And so I just want a spouse because I want to be like everybody else. I want a husband because I want to be like everybody else. When really what marriage is for is to shape you and guide you and to make you into the image of the Son. And God can do that through numerous means, but marriage is one of the most common and one of the, 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 most, uh, one of the greatest ways of doing that. Is that why you want to get married? So that you can be shaped more into the image of God? Or do you want to get married so you can be like everybody else and go to social hours? Why do you want a kid? Why are you asking God for a child? Do you want a child because all your friends have play dates and you feel left out? Or do you want a child because you recognize that God gives us children as believers to pour into them and to disciple them and to raise them up into the image of Christ so that they might carry on the work of the gospel in the world? Why do you want kids? Is it for you? Or is it for the glory of God? Why do you want to change jobs? Why are you unhappy in the work that you do? Is it because you believe that God made you for something and what you're doing is choking the life out of you and you don't feel like you can give Him glory or what you're being asked to do at your job is maybe questionably moral and so you're wanting to get out of that? Or do you want to change in job because, you know what, I just feel like I'm in a dead end and... You know, yeah, I've built some relationships where I'm telling people about Jesus, but I'll just leave them the moment a better opportunity comes along. Why do you want a different job? As Christians, our desires have to be ruled and governed by something greater than what we feel like doing at the time. It doesn't mean you can't have desires. It just means that your desires cannot rule you. Scripture's full of people that abuse the gifts that God gives them. We do not need to be like that. So what's your motivation? What do you want out of church? Why are you here? Why are you thinking of leaving, maybe? Can I say that? Or are you talking to your friends and you're hearing about their church experience and you're like, oh, I want that. Here's an idea. Maybe hang around and help us make that experience here. I'm not trying to guilt you. Sometimes God does lead us to another church. But if we walk into church and we think to ourselves, I didn't get anything out of that, that is not what church is about. Be careful with our desires. Hold them in check. They're one of the most dangerous things that you possess. Desire. So coveting isn't going to get us what we want, which is peace and enjoyment. It leads us to all sorts of anxiety. Some of you are getting stressed right now just thinking about it. Like I'm going after your stuff and you're like, no. <laughs> right? Stay away, bad man. It's not going to get us what we want. So what is going to get us what we want? We need to trade our anxiety for peace. We need to trade our anxiety for peace. So the first thing you're probably going to do is you're going to think to yourself, okay, Travis, I'm on board. My desires are out of control. I want to, I want to get this reined in. I'm going to stop coveting. Okay. Great plan. Turn with me to Romans 7. I'm going to tell you why that's not necessarily the best plan. It's a noble desire. Romans 7, verse 7. This is Paul writing. And he says, what then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin, for I would not have known what it is to covet if law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. Paul, some people believe in writing this, is saying, I was looking at the Ten Commandments, I was looking at all the law of God, and I thought, okay, if it's external, I can keep it. But then he gets to the Tenth Commandment, and he's like, oh, man. I, I can't control the fact that when somebody walks into the room and I see them rocking some jewelry that I want it. I can't control that impulse. I'm guilty. And he recognizes that he can't control his covetousness. Paul was good Pharisee. He was good at acting religious. Some of you are better. Some of us are better at acting religious, given the day. 
But you can't keep the 10th commandment and you can't keep any of them. So that'll lead you to ask a question. And you should have been asking it all along, the whole time we've been doing the Ten Commandments. Does that make the law bad, or does that make me bad? If I can't keep the law, then why'd God give it? It's an unkeepable standard. And Paul tells us that no, the law's not bad. The law is, in fact, good because it tells us how to, not just how to, not how to have a relationship with God, but what are the rules of the relationship with God? How do we engage with Him? How do we interact with Him? You have rules in every relationship that you're in. There are rules and standards that you, practices that you have. But then Paul tells us in, in Romans 7 that sin comes alive, which is, is just a way of saying sin kind of co-ops the law. It's supposed to be good, it's supposed to be for life, and sin co-ops it and makes it even worse. So when you were a kid and mom and dad would tell you to do something or not to do something, what did that make you want to do? I have a two-year-old now. I'll tell you what it makes you want to do. You go over it, you go over to it, and you don't touch it, but you like hover over it. And you say, no, 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 no. Yeah, that's a no, no. That's a no, no. The law almost makes us want something more. Because God has told us no, and we don't trust him. Because of what happened in the garden, we don't trust God very well. We think he's holding out on us. We think there's good things that he's not giving to us. And so we're just like Adam and Eve. He's holding that fruit back for a reason. He's afraid of us. Let's take it. That's coveting. That's coveting. Now, you might think, wow, this is really bad news, Travis. Yeah, it is. But God, in his infinite wisdom, uses the law for good. Because hopefully, after nine weeks of talking about the Ten Commandments, you have realized you can't keep the law, which puts you exactly where Paul was before he came to Christ, before the Damascus Road. It puts you in a position where you realize, I need help. I need help. And Paul keeps writing. Turn to Romans 8, verse 1. The last place you ever need to look for peace is Jesus Christ. He's the last place you ever need to look for peace. Romans 8.1 says this, There is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. None. I want you to let that wash over you for a little bit. There is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. None, zip, zero, zilch, nada. If you're a believer, if you're someone who's trusted in God, you, can, you have peace with God. If you're not, that opportunity is available to you today. You can have peace with God. Look at Romans 8, 2. Paul keeps writing. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. God knows you're broken. God knows I'm broken too. God knows you and I have done messed up things things that we have a hard time forgiving ourselves for, much less thinking God could ever do that himself. And it's why God sends his son, because you have to keep the law to please him, and none of us can. So there's one man, the son of God, he puts on flesh, he comes and dwells amongst men, keeping the law perfectly. Think about it. Jesus never coveted, ever. He never looked at something somebody else had and think, man, I wish I had that instead of, you know, having to go to the cross. Never. He lives a perfect life. Dies on the cross in our place because that's what not keeping the law deserves. We deserve to die for it. It's punishable by death. Almost every single one of the commandments, breaking them leads to death. God's pretty clear about that. But Jesus dies in our place. And if you believe in him, if you put your faith in him, if you say, you know what, God, I'm going to stop trying to be religious, because if you start trying to be religious, if you're trying to earn God's goodwill through works, you know what that's going to do? It's going to actually create more covetousness because you're going to look at everybody else who's more religious than you are, and you think, oh man, I got to do better. I wish I had a relationship with God like that deacon or like that pastor. It just breeds more coveting. It doesn't work. You have to break the cycle, and the only way to do that is by trusting Jesus Christ. By looking at his work, Maybe the only thing we're allowed to covet is to look at Jesus and be like, I want that to count for me. And God says, yes, it can. It will count for you. You need only believe that that is all you need to do. And you can have peace with God. 
peace with yourself, and peace with everybody around you. Now, if you're a believer, that's what's offered for you. And maybe this is the first time. Like you're a brand new Christian right now. Yay. You can have peace with yourself and with others. You ever been on a plane? It's really loud. Kids crying, screaming. Air noise, you know, going on. And then God invented these wonderful things called noise-canceling headphones. And you're like, I don't hear anything. Silence. Paul describes what it's like to walk according to the Spirit. He says in verse 4, In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, those who, sorry, in order the righteous law might be filled, fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their mind on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. Setting your mind on the flesh is not having the noise-canceling headphones. It's just message after message. You can't concentrate. You can't focus. You're getting inundated with all this. You need more. You need more. You need more. You're never going to be complete unless you're like everybody else. You're never going to complete unless you have their stuff. You need to be, need to be, need to be. But then you have the Spirit living inside of you. Because when you become a Christian, that's what happens. The Spirit comes and dwells inside of you, and you get those noise-canceling headphones. And you can put them on, and you can hear the voice of the Spirit saying, this is the way, walk in it. You are a beloved child of God, and you don't need any of that just need me and you can be satisfied. Jonathan Edwards says the enjoyment of God is the only happiness with which our souls can be satisfied and that is the offer that Jesus gives you today and every day out. It's peace and I think it's something we all want. Jesus Christ can give you peace today. Peace with yourself to not constantly be chasing after everything and everybody else. Peace with other people and peace chiefly chiefly with God. There's a reason why he's called the Prince of Peace. And he wants to rule and reign in your life. And when he does, watch your selfishness be replaced by generosity. Watch your disobedience be replaced with obedience. Watch you become more and more into the image of the Son of God and watch things change. I know what you're thinking. Travis, that sounds really easy. Some of it is, some of it's not. You daily will wrestle with your passions and your desires. But I'll tell you this, you're never going to beat them apart from Christ. And you will cut a swath through your life and through humanity drenched in covetousness and desires and hurting other people. If you don't. And he stands ready. He stands ready to have a relationship with you to show you a better way if you will just believe. You can leave a life of anxiety behind and take one of peace with Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, you have given a better way. And for you, that way meant going down the road, carrying your own cross for a distance until you couldn't manage it anymore. Because even though you were fully God, you were fully man. And another man carried your cross and it was set up on a roadside and you suffered and died so that we might live, so that we could have a better way, so we didn't have to walk that path. And so God, I pray for each person in this room that maybe is on that path thinking they got to do it themselves. Lord, I pray that you would set them free from that lie. Pray that you would set them free from the voice of the evil one saying in their ear, we couldn't agree with you more. Lord God, I pray that you would speak to them today and tell them that's not the way. Come with me. I will show you the way. Set us free from anxiety. Give us a life of peace, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray.